that little square box. All aboard, said the captain. All aboard, sir, said the mate. Then stand by to let her go. It was nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning. The good ship Spartan was lying off Boston Quay, with her cargo under hatches, her passengers shipped, and everything prepared for a start. The warning whistle had been sounded twice, the final bell had been rung, her bowsprit was turned towards England, and the hiss of escaping steam showed that all was ready for her run of three thousand miles. She strained at the warps that held her, like a greyhound at its leash. I have the misfortune to be a very nervous man. A sedentary, literary life has helped to increase the morbid love of solitude which, even in my boyhood, was one of my distinguishing characteristics. As I stood upon the quarter-deck of the transatlantic steamer, I bitterly cursed the necessity which drove me back to the land of my forefathers. The shouts of the sailors, the rattle of the cordage, the farewells of my fellow passengers and the cheers of the mob, each and all, jarred upon my sensitive nature. I felt sad, too. An indescribable feeling, as of some impending calamity, seemed to haunt me. The sea was calm and the breeze light. There was nothing to disturb the equanimity of the most confirmed of landsmen. Yet I felt as if I stood upon the verge of a great, though indefinable danger. I have noticed that such presentiments occur often in men of my peculiar temperament, and that they are not uncommonly fulfilled. There is a theory that it arises from a species of second sight, a subtle spiritual communication with the future. I well remember that Herr Raumer, the eminent spiritualist, remarked on one occasion that I was the most sensitive subject as regards supernatural phenomena that he had ever encountered in the whole of his wide experience. Be that as it may, I certainly felt far from happy as I threaded my way among the weeping, cheering groups which dotted the white decks of the good ship Spartan. Had I known the experience which awaited me in the course of the next twelve hours, I would, even then, at the last moment, have sprung upon the shore and made my escape from the accursed vessel. Time's up, said the captain, closing his chronometer with a snap and replacing it in his pocket. Time's up, said the mate. There was at last a wail from the whistle, a rush of friends and relatives upon the land. One warp was loosened, the gangway was being pushed away, when there was a shout from the bridge and two men appeared running rapidly down the quay. They were waving their hands and making frantic gestures, apparently with the intention of stopping the ship. "'Look sharp!' shouted the crowd. "'Hold hard!' cried the captain. "'Ease her! Stop her! Up with the gangway!' And the two men sprang aboard just as the second warp parted, and a convulsive throb of the engine shot us clear of the shore. There was a cheer from the deck another from the quay, a mighty fluttering of handkerchiefs, and the great vessel ploughed its way out of the harbour and steamed grandly away across the placid bay. We were fairly started upon our fortnight's voyage. There was a general dive among the passengers in quest of berths and luggage, while a popping of corks in the saloon proved that more than one bereaved traveller was adopting artificial means for drowning the pangs of separation. I glanced round the deck and took a running inventory of my compagnon de voyage. They presented the usual types met with upon these occasions. There was no striking face among them. I speak as a connoisseur, for faces are a specialty of mine. I pounce upon a characteristic feature as a botanist does on a flower, and bear it away with me to analyse at my leisure, and classify and label it in my little anthropological museum. There was nothing worthy of me here. Twenty types of young America going to Europe. A few respectable middle-aged couples as an antidote. A sprinkling of clergymen and professional men, young ladies... Bagmen, British exclusives, and all the hola podrida of an ocean-going steamer. 
I turned away from them and gazed back at the receding shores of America, and as a cloud of remembrances rose before me, my heart warmed towards the land of my adoption. A pile of portmanteaus and luggage chanced to be lying on one side of the deck, awaiting their turn to be taken below. With my usual love for solitude, I walked behind these, and sitting on a coil of rope between them and the vessel's side, I indulged in a melancholy reverie. I was aroused from this by a whisper behind me. "'Here's a quiet place,' said the voice. "'Sit down, and we can talk it over in safety.' Glancing through a chink between two colossal chests, I saw that the passengers who had joined us at the last moment were standing at the other side of the pile. They had evidently failed to see me as I crouched in the shadow of the boxes. The one who had spoken was a tall and very thin man, with a blue-black beard and a colourless face. His manner was nervous and excited. His companion was a short, plethoric little fellow, with a brisk and resolute air. He had a cigar in his mouth, and a large ulster slung over his left arm. They both glanced round uneasily, as if to ascertain whether they were alone. This is just the place, I heard the other say. They sat down on a bale of goods with their backs turned towards me, and I found myself, much against my will, playing the unpleasant part of eavesdropper to their conversation. "'Well, Muller,' said the taller of the two, "'we've got it aboard right enough.' "'Yes,' assented the man whom he had addressed as Muller. "'It's safe aboard. "'It was rather a near go. "'It was that, Flanagan. "'It wouldn't have done to have missed the ship. "'No, it would have put our plans out. "'Ruin them entirely,' said the little man, and puffed furiously at his cigar for some minutes. "'I've got it here,' he said at last. "'Let me see it. Is no one looking?' "'No, they are nearly all below.' "'We can't be too careful, for so much is at stake,' said Muller, as he uncoiled the ulster which hung over his arm, and disclosed a dark object which he laid upon the deck. One glance at it was enough to cause me to spring to my feet with an exclamation of horror. Luckily they were so engrossed in the matter on hand that neither of them observed me. Had they turned their heads, they would infallibly have seen my pale face glaring at them over the pile of boxes. From the first moment of their conversation, a horrible misgiving had come over me. It seemed more than confirmed as I gazed at what lay before me. It was a little square box, made of some dark wood, and ribbed with brass. I suppose it was about the size of a cubic foot. It reminded me of a pistol case, only it was decidedly higher. There was an appendage to it, however, on which my eyes were riveted, and which suggested the pistol itself rather than its receptacle. This was a trigger-like arrangement upon the lid to which a coil of string was attached. Beside this trigger, there was a small square aperture through the wood. The tall man, Flanagan, as his companion called him, applied his eye to this, and peered in for several minutes with an expression of intense anxiety upon his face. It seems right enough, he said at last. I tried not to shake it, said his companion. Such delicate things need delicate treatment. Put in some of the needful, Muller. The shorter man fumbled in his pocket for some time, and then produced a small paper packet. He opened this and took out of it half a handful of whitish granules, which he poured down through the hole. A curious clicking noise followed from the inside of the box, and both men smiled in a satisfied way. Nothing much wrong there, said Flanagan. "'Right as a trivet,' answered his companion. "'Look out, here's someone coming. "'Take it down to our berth. "'I wouldn't do to have anyone suspecting what our game is, "'or worse still, have them fumbling with it "'and letting it off by mistake.' "'Well, it would come to the same, whoever let it off,' said Muller. "'They'd be rather astonished if they pulled the trigger,' said the taller, "'with a sinister laugh. 
Ha <laughs> ha, fancy their faces. It's not a bad bit of workmanship, I flatter myself. No, said Muller. I hear it is your own design, every bit of it, isn't it? Yes, the spring and the sliding shutter are my own. We should take out a patent. And the two men laughed again with a cold, harsh laugh, as they took up the little brass-bound package and concealed it in Muller's voluminous overcoat. Come down, and we'll stow it in our berth, said Flanagan. We won't need it until tonight, and it will be safe there. His companion assented, and the two went arm in arm along the deck and disappeared down the hatchway, bearing the mysterious little box away with them. The last words I heard were a muttered injunction from Flanagan to carry it carefully and avoid knocking it against the bulwarks. How long I remained sitting on that coil of rope, I shall never know. The horror of the conversation I had just overheard was aggravated by the first sinking qualms of seasickness. The long roll of the Atlantic was beginning to assert itself over both ship and passengers. I felt prostrated in mind and in body, and fell into a state of collapse, from which I was finally aroused by the hearty voice of our worthy quartermaster. "'Do you mind moving out of that, sir?' he said. "'We want to get this lumber cleared off the deck.' His bluff manner and ruddy, healthy face seemed to be a positive insult to me in my present condition. Had I been a courageous or muscular man, I could have struck him. As it was, I treated the honest sailor to a melodramatic scowl, which seemed to cause him no small astonishment, and strode past him to the other side of the deck. Solitude was what I wanted— solitude in which I could brood over the frightful crime which was being hatched before my very eyes. One of the quarter-boats was hanging rather low down upon the davits. An idea struck me, and, climbing on the bulwarks, I stepped into the empty boat and lay down in the bottom of it. Stretched on my back with nothing but the blue sky above me, and an occasional view of the mizzen as the vessel rolled, I was at least alone with my sickness and my thoughts. I tried to recall the words which had been spoken in the terrible dialogue I had overheard. Would they admit of any construction but the one which stared me in the face? My reason forced me to confess that they would not. I endeavoured to array the various facts which formed the chain of circumstantial evidence, and to find a flaw in it. But no, not a link was missing. There was the strange way in which our passengers had come aboard, enabling them to evade any examination of their luggage. The very name of Flanagan smacked of Fenianism, while Muller suggested nothing but socialism and murder. Then their mysterious manner, their remark that their plans would have been ruined had they missed the ship, their fear of being observed, last but not least, the clenching evidence in the production of the little square box with the trigger, and their grim joke about the face of the man who should let it off by mistake. Could these facts lead to any conclusion other than that they were the desperate emissaries of some body, political or otherwise, and intended to sacrifice themselves, their fellow passengers and the ship, in one great holocaust. The whitish granules, which I had seen one of them pour into the box, formed no doubt a fuse or train for exploding it. I had myself heard a sound come from it, which might have emanated from some delicate piece of machinery. But what did they mean by their allusion to tonight? Could it be that they contemplated putting their horrible design into execution on the very first evening of our voyage? The mere thought of it sent a cold shudder over me, and made me for a moment superior even to the agonies of seasickness. I have remarked that I am a physical coward. I am a moral one also. It is seldom that the two defects are united to such a degree in the one character. I have known many men who were most sensitive to bodily danger, 
and yet were distinguished for the independence and strength of their minds. In my own case, however, I regret to say that my quiet and retiring habits had fostered a nervous dread of doing anything remarkable or making myself conspicuous, which exceeded, if possible, my fear of personal peril. An ordinary mortal, placed under the circumstances in which I now found myself, would have gone at once to the captain, confessed his fears, and put the matter into his hands. To me, however, constituted as I am, the idea was most repugnant. The thought of becoming the observed of all observers, cross-questioned by a stranger and confronted with two desperate conspirators in the character of a denouncer, was hateful to me. Might it not, by some remote possibility, prove that I was mistaken? What would be my feelings if there should turn out to be no grounds for my accusation? No, I would procrastinate. I would keep my eye on the two desperados and dog them at every turn. Anything was better than the possibility of being wrong. Then it struck me that even at that moment some new phase of the conspiracy might be developing itself. The nervous excitement seemed to have driven away my incipient attack of sickness, for I was able to stand up and lower myself from the boat without experiencing any return of it. I staggered along the deck with the intention of descending into the cabin and finding how my acquaintances of the morning were occupying themselves. Just as I had my hand on the companion rail, I was astonished by receiving a hearty slap on the back, which nearly shot me down the steps with more haste than dignity. "'Is that you, Hammond?' said a voice which I seemed to recognise. "'God bless me,' I said as I turned round. "'It can't be Dick Merton.' "'Why, how are you, old man?' This was an unexpected piece of luck in the midst of my perplexities. Dick was just the man I wanted, kindly and shrewd in his nature and prompt in his actions. I should have no difficulty in telling him my suspicions, and could rely upon his sound sense to point out the best course to pursue. Since I was a little lad in the second form at Harrow, Dick had been my adviser and protector, he saw at a glance that something had gone wrong with me. Hello, he said in his kindly way. What's put you about, Hammond? You look as white as a sheet. <laughs> Mal de mer, eh? No, not that altogether, said I. Walk up and down with me, Dick. I want to speak to you. Give me your arm. Supporting myself on Dick's stalwart frame, I tottered along by his side. But it was some time before I could muster resolution to speak. "'Have a cigar,' said he, breaking the silence. "'No, thanks,' said I. "'Dick, we shall all be corpses tonight.' "'That's no reason against your having a cigar now,' said Dick, in his cool way. But looking hard at me from under his shaggy eyebrows as he spoke, he evidently thought that my intellect was a little gone. "'No,' I continued, "'it's no laughing matter, and I speak in sober earnest, I assure you.' I have discovered an infamous conspiracy, Dick, to destroy this ship and every soul that is in her. And I then proceeded systematically and in order to lay before him the chain of evidence which I had collected. There, Dick, I said as I concluded, what do you think of that? And above all, what am I to do? To my astonishment, he burst into a hearty fit of laughter. I'd be frightened, he said, if any fellow but you had told me as much. You always had a way, Hammond, of discovering mare's nests. I like to see the old traits breaking out again. Do you remember at school how you swore there was a ghost in the long room and how it turned out to be your own reflection in the mirror? Why, man, he continued, what object would any one have in destroying this ship? We have no great political guns aboard. On the contrary, the majority of the passengers are Americans. Besides, in this sober nineteenth century, the most wholesale murderers stop at including themselves among their victims. Depend upon it. You have misunderstood them, and have mistaken a photographic camera or something equally innocent for an infernal machine. Nothing of the sort, sir, said I rather touchily. You will learn to your cost, I fear, that I have neither exaggerated nor misinterpreted a word. As to the box... 
I have certainly never before seen one like it. It contained delicate machinery, of that I am convinced, from the way in which the men handled it and spoke of it. You'd make out every packet of perishable goods to be a torpedo, said Dick, if that is to be your only test. The man's name was Flanagan, I continued. I don't think that would go very far in a court of law, said Dick, but come, I've finished my cigar. Suppose we go down together and split a bottle of claret. You can point out these two Orsinis to me, if they are still in the cabin. All right, I answered. I am determined not to lose sight of them all day. Don't look hard at them, though, for I don't want them to think that they are being watched. Trust me, said Dick. I'll look as unconscious and guileless as a lamb. And with that we passed down the companion and into the saloon. A good many passengers were scattered about the great central table, some wrestling with refractory carpet bags and rug straps, some having their luncheon, and a few reading and otherwise amusing themselves. The objects of our quest were not there. We passed down the room and peered into every berth, but there was no sign of them. Heavens, thought I, perhaps at this very moment they are beneath our feet, in the hold or engine room, preparing their diabolical contrivance. It was better to know the worst than to remain in such suspense. Steward, said Dick, are there any other gentlemen about? There's two in the smoking room, sir, answered the steward. The smoking room was a little snuggery, luxuriously fitted up and adjoining the pantry. We pushed the door open and entered. A sigh of relief escaped from my bosom. The very first object on which my eye rested was the cadaverous face of Flanagan, with its hard-set mouth and unwinking eye. His companion sat opposite to him. They were both drinking, and a pile of cards lay upon the table. They were engaged in playing as we entered. I nudged Dick to show him that we had found our quarry, and we sat down beside them with as unconcerned an air as possible. The two conspirators seemed to take little notice of our presence. I watched them both narrowly. The game at which they were playing was Napoleon. Both were adepts at it, and I could not help admiring the consummate nerve of men who, with such a secret at their hearts, could devote their minds to the manipulating of a long suit or the finessing of a queen. Money changed hands rapidly, but the run of luck seemed to be all against the taller of the two players. At last he threw down his cards on the table with an oath and refused to go on. No, I'm hanged if I do, he said. I haven't had more than two of a suit for five hands. Never mind, said his comrade as he gathered up his winnings. A few dollars one way or the other won't go very far after tonight's work. I was astonished at the rascal's audacity, but took care to keep my eyes fixed abstractedly upon the ceiling, and drank my wine in as unconscious a manner as possible. I felt that Flanagan was looking towards me with his wolfish eyes to see if I had noticed the illusion. He whispered something to his companion which I failed to catch. It was a caution, I suppose, for the other answered rather angrily, "'Nonsense! Why shouldn't I say what I like? "'Over-caution is just what would ruin us.' "'I believe you wanted not to come off,' said Flanagan. "'You believe nothing of the sort,' said the other, speaking rapidly and loudly. "'You know as well as I do that when I play for a stake I like to win it, "'but I won't have my words criticised and cut short by you or any other man. "'I have as much interest in our success as you have. More, I hope.' "'He was quite hot about it.' and puffed furiously at his cigar for a few minutes. The eyes of the other ruffian wandered alternately from Dick Merton to myself. I knew that I was in the presence of a desperate man, that a quiver of my lip might be the signal for him to plunge a weapon into my heart. But I betrayed more self-command than I should have given myself credit for under such trying circumstances. As to Dick... He was as immovable and apparently as unconscious as the Egyptian sphinx. There was silence for some time in the smoking room, broken only by the crisp rattle of the cards 
as the man Muller shuffled them up before replacing them in his pocket. He still seemed to be somewhat flushed and irritable. Throwing the end of his cigar into the spittoon, he glanced defiantly at his companion and turned towards me. "'Can you tell me, sir,' he said, "'when this ship will be heard of again?' They were both looking at me. But though my face may have turned a trifle paler, my voice was as steady as ever as I answered. I presume, sir, that it will be heard of first when it enters Queenstown Harbour. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed the angry little man. I knew you would say that. Don't you kick me under the table, Flanagan. I won't stand it. I know what I am doing. You are wrong, sir, he continued, turning to me. Utterly wrong. Some passing ship, perhaps, suggested Dick. No, nor that either. The weather is fine, I said. Why should we not be heard of at our destination? I didn't say we shouldn't be heard of at our destination. No doubt we shall, in the course of time. But that is not where we shall be heard of first. Where, then? asked Dick. That you will never know. Suffice it that a rapid and mysterious agency will signal our whereabouts, and that before the day is out. <laughs> and he chuckled once again. Come on, Deck, growled his comrade. You've drunk too much of that confounded brandy and water. It has loosened your tongue. Come away. And taking him by the arm, he half led him, half forced him out of the smoking room, and we heard them stumbling up the companion together and onto the deck. Well, what do you think now? I gasped as I turned towards Dick. He was as imperturbable as ever. Think, he said, why, I think what his companion thinks, that we have been listening to the ravings of a half-drunken man. The fellow stunk of brandy. Nonsense, Dick, you saw how the other tried to stop his tongue. Of course he did, he didn't want his friend to make a fool of himself before strangers. Maybe the short one is a lunatic, and the other his private keeper. It's quite possible. Oh, Dick, Dick, I cried, how can you be so blind? Don't you see that every word confirmed our previous suspicion? Humbug, man, said Dick, you're working yourself into a state of nervous excitement. Why, what the devil do you make of all that nonsense about a mysterious agent which would signal our whereabouts? I'll tell you what he meant, Dick, I said, bending forward and grasping my friend's arm. He meant a sudden glare and a flash seen far out at sea by some lonely fisherman off the American coast. That's what he meant. I didn't think you were such a fool, Hammond, said Dick Merton testily. If you try to fix a literal meaning on the twaddle that every drunken man talks, you will come to some queer conclusions. Let us follow their example and go on deck. You need fresh air, I think. Depend upon it, your liver is out of order. A sea voyage will do you a world of good. If ever I see the end of this one, I groaned, I'll promise never to venture on another. They are laying the cloth, so it's hardly worth my while going up. I'll stay below and finish my smoke. I hope dinner will find you in a more pleasant state of mind, said Dick. And he went out, leaving me to my thoughts, until the clang of the great gong summoned us to the saloon. My appetite, I need hardly say, had not been improved by the incidents which had occurred during the day. I sat down, however, mechanically at the table and listened to the talk which was going on around me. There were nearly a hundred first-class passengers, and as the wine began to circulate, their voices combined with the clash of the dishes to form a perfect babel. I found myself seated between a very stout and nervous old lady and a prim little clergyman, and as neither made any advances, I retired into my shell and spent my time in observing the appearance of my fellow voyagers. I could see Dick in the dim distance, dividing his attentions between a jointless fowl in front of him and a self-possessed young lady at his side. Captain Dowie was doing the honours at my end, while the surgeon of the vessel was seated at the other. I was glad to notice that Flanagan was placed almost opposite to me. As long as I had him before my eyes, I knew that, for the time at least, we were safe. 
He was sitting with what was meant to be a sociable smile on his grim face. It did not escape me that he drank largely of wine, so largely that even before the dessert appeared, his voice had become decidedly husky. His friend Muller was seated a few places lower down. He ate little and appeared to be nervous and restless. Now, ladies, said our genial captain, I trust that you will consider yourselves at home aboard my vessel. I have no fears for the gentlemen. A bottle of champagne, steward. Here's to a fresh breeze and a quick passage. I trust our friends in America will hear of our safe arrival in twelve days, or a fortnight at the very latest. I looked up. Quick as was the glance which passed between Flanagan and his confederate, I was able to intercept it. There was an evil smile upon the former's thin lips. The conversation rippled on, politics, the sea, amusements, religion. Each was in turn discussed. I remained a silent, though an interested listener. It struck me that no harm could be done by introducing the subject which was ever in my mind. It could be managed in an off-hand way, and would at least have the effect of turning the captain's thoughts in that direction. I could watch, too, what effect it would have upon the faces of the conspirators. There was a sudden lull in the conversation. The ordinary subjects of interest appeared to be exhausted. The opportunity was a favourable one. "'May I ask, Captain,' I said, bending forward and speaking very distinctly, "'what you think of Fenian manifestos?' The Captain's ruddy face became a shade darker from honest indignation. "'They are poor cowardly things,' he said, "'as silly as they are wicked. "'The impotent threats of a set of anonymous scoundrels,' said a pompous-looking old gentleman beside him. "'Oh, Captain!' said the fat lady at my side. You don't really think they would blow up a ship? I have no doubt they would if they could, but I am very sure they will never blow up mine. May I ask what precautions are taken against them? said an elderly man at the end of the table. All goods sent aboard the ship are strictly examined, said Captain Dowie. But suppose a man brought explosives aboard with him, said I. They are too cowardly to risk their own lives in that way. During this conversation, Flanagan had not betrayed the slightest interest in what was going on. He raised his head now and looked at the captain. Don't you think you are rather underrating them? He said. Every secret society has produced desperate men. Why shouldn't the Fenians have them too? Many think it's a privilege to die in the service of a cause which seems right in their eyes though others may think it wrong. Indiscriminate murder cannot be right in anybody's eyes, said the little clergyman. The bombardment of Paris was nothing else, said Flanagan. Yet the whole civilized world agreed to look on with folded arms and change the ugly word murder into the more euphonious one of war. It seemed right enough to German eyes. Why shouldn't dynamite seem so to the Fenian? At any rate, their empty vaporings have led to nothing as yet, said the captain. Excuse me, returned Flanagan, but is there not some room for doubt yet as to the fate of the Dotteral? I have met men in America who asserted from their own personal knowledge that there was a coal torpedo aboard that vessel. Then they lied, said the captain. It was proved conclusively at the court-martial to have arisen from an explosion of coal gas— but we had better change the subject, or we may cause the ladies to have a restless night. And the conversation once more drifted back into its original channel. During this little discussion, Flanagan had argued his point with a gentlemanly deference and a quiet power for which I had not given him credit. I could not help admiring a man who, on the eve of a desperate enterprise, could courteously argue upon a point which must touch him so nearly. He had, as I have already mentioned, partaken of a considerable quantity of wine. But though there was a slight flush upon his pale cheek, his manner was as reserved as ever. He did not join in the conversation again, 
but seemed to be lost in thought. A whirl of conflicting ideas was battling in my own mind. What was I to do? Should I stand up now and denounce them before both passengers and captain? Should I demand a few minutes' conversation with the latter in his own cabin and reveal it all? For an instant I was half resolved to do it, but then the old constitutional timidity came back with redoubled force. After all, there might be some mistake. Dick had heard the evidence and had refused to believe in it. I determined to let things go on their course. A strange, reckless feeling came over me. Why should I help men who were blind to their own dangers? Surely it was the duty of the officers to protect us, not ours to give warning to them. I drank off a couple of glasses of wine and staggered upon deck with the determination of keeping my secret locked in my own bosom. It was a glorious evening. Even in my excited state of mind, I could not help leaning against the bulwarks and enjoying the refreshing breeze. Away to the westward a solitary sail stood out as a dark speck against the great sheet of flame left by the setting sun. I shuddered as I looked at it. It seemed like a sea of blood. A single star was twinkling faintly above our main mast, but a thousand seemed to gleam in the water below with every stroke of our propeller. The only blot in the fair scene was the great trail of smoke which stretched away behind us like a black slash upon a crimson curtain. It seemed hard to believe that the great peace which hung over all nature could be marred by a poor, miserable mortal. After all, I thought as I gazed upon the blue depths beneath me, if the worst comes to the worst, it is better to die here than to linger in agony upon a sick bed on land. A man's life seems a very paltry thing amid the great forces of nature. All my philosophy could not prevent my shuddering, however, when I turned my head and saw two shadowy figures at the other side of the deck, which I had no difficulty in recognising. They seemed to be conversing earnestly, but I had no opportunity of overhearing what was said, so I contented myself with pacing up and down and keeping a vigilant watch upon their movements. It was a relief to me when Dick came on deck. Even an incredulous confidant is better than none at all. Well, old man, he said, giving me a facetious dig in the ribs, we've not been blown up yet. No, not yet, said I. But that's no proof that we are not going to be. Nonsense, man, said Dick. I can't conceive what has put this extraordinary idea into your head. I've been talking to one of your supposed assassins, and he seems a pleasant enough fellow. Quite a sporting character, I should think, from the way he speaks. Dick, I said, I am as certain that those men have an infernal machine, and that we are on the verge of eternity, as if I saw them putting the match to the fuse. Well, if you really think so, said Dick half awed for the moment by the earnestness of my manner. It is your duty to let the captain know of your suspicions. You are right, I said, I will. My absurd timidity has prevented my doing so sooner. I believe our lives can only be saved by laying the whole matter before him. Well, go and do it now, said Dick. But for goodness sake, don't mix me up in the matter. I'll speak to him when he comes off the bridge, I answered. And in the meantime... I don't mean to lose sight of them. Let me know of the result, said my companion. And with a nod he strolled away in search, I fancy, of his partner at the dinner table. Left to myself, I bethought me of my retreat of the morning, and climbing on the bulwark I mounted into the quarter-boat and lay down there. In it I could reconsider my course of action, and by raising my head I was able, at any time, to get a view of my disagreeable neighbours. An hour passed, and the captain was still on the bridge. He was talking to one of the passengers, a retired naval officer, 
and the two were deep in debate concerning some abstruse point in navigation. I could see the red tips of their cigars from where I lay. It was dark now, so dark that I could hardly make out the figures of Flanagan and his accomplice. They were still standing in the position which they had taken up after dinner. A few of the passengers were scattered about the deck, but many had gone below. A strange stillness seemed to pervade the air. The voices of the watch and the rattle of the wheel were the only sounds which broke the silence. Another half hour passed. The captain was still upon the bridge. It seemed as if he would never come down. My nerves were in a state of unnatural tension, so much so that the sound of two steps upon the deck made me start up in a quiver of excitement. I peered over the side of the boat and saw that our suspicious passengers had crossed from the other side and were standing almost directly beneath me. The light of a binnacle fell full upon the ghastly face of the ruffian Flanagan. Even in that short glance... I saw that Muller had the ulster, whose use I knew so well, slung loosely over his arm. I sank back with a groan. It seemed that my fatal procrastination had sacrificed two hundred innocent lives. I had read of the fiendish vengeance which awaited a spy. I knew that men with their lives in their hands would stick at nothing, all I could do was to cower at the bottom of the boat and listen silently to their whispered talk below. This place will do, said a voice. Yes, the leeward side is best. I wonder if the trigger will act. I'm sure it will. We were to let it off at ten, were we not? Yes, at ten sharp. We have eight minutes yet. There was a pause. Then the voice began again. They'll hear the drop of the trigger, won't they? It doesn't matter. It will be too late for anyone to prevent its going off. That's true. There will be some excitement among those we have left behind, won't there? Rather, how long do you reckon it will be before they hear of us? The first news will get in, in about twenty-four hours. That will be mine. No, mine. Ha <laughs> ha, we'll settle that. There was a pause here. Then I heard Muller's voice in a ghastly whisper, there's only five minutes more. How slowly the moments seemed to pass. I could count them by the throbbing of my heart. It'll make a sensation on land, said a voice. Yes, it will make a noise in the newspapers. I raised my head and peered over the side of the boat. There seemed no hope, no help. Death stared me in the face whether I did or did not give the alarm. The captain had at last left the bridge. The deck was deserted, save for those two dark figures crouching in the shadow of the boat. Flanagan had a watch lying open in his hand. Three minutes more, he said. Put it down upon the deck. No, put it here, on the bulwarks. It was the little square box. I knew by the sound that they had placed it near the davit, and almost exactly under my head. I looked over again. Flanagan was pouring something out of a paper into his hand. It was white and granular, the same that I had seen him use in the morning. It was meant as a fuse, no doubt, for he shoveled it into the little box and I heard the strange noise which had previously arrested my attention. A minute and a half more, he said. Shall you or I pull the string? I will pull it, said Muller. He was kneeling down and holding the end in his hand. Flanagan stood behind with his arms folded and an air of grim resolution upon his face. I could stand it no longer, my nervous system seemed to give way in a moment. Stop! I screamed, springing to my feet. Stop! Misguided and unprincipled men! They both staggered backwards. I fancied they thought I was a spirit. 
with the moonlight streaming down upon my pale face. I was brave enough now. I had gone too far to retreat. Cain was damned, I cried, and he slew but one. Would you have the blood of two hundred upon your souls? He's mad, said Flanagan. Time's up. Let it off, Muller. I sprang down upon the deck. You shan't do it, I said. By what right do you prevent us? By every right, human and divine. It's no business of yours. Clear out of this. Never, said I. Confine the fellow. There's too much at stake to stand on ceremony. I'll hold him, Muller, while you pull the trigger. Next moment I was struggling in the Herculean grasp of the Irishman. Resistance was useless. I was a child in his hands. He pinned me up against the side of the vessel and held me there. Nigh, he said, look sharp, he can't prevent us. I felt that I was standing on the verge of eternity. Half strangled in the arms of the taller ruffian, I saw the other approach the fatal box. He stooped over it and seized the string. I breathed one prayer when I saw his grasp tighten upon it. Then came a sharp snap, a strange rasping noise. The trigger had fallen. The side of the box flew out and let off. Two grey carrier pigeons. Little more need be said. It is not a subject on which I care to dwell. The whole thing is too utterly disgusting and absurd. Perhaps the best thing I can do is to retire gracefully from the scene and let the sporting correspondent of the New York Herald fill my unworthy place. Here is an extract clipped from its columns shortly after our departure from America. Pigeon flying extraordinary. A novel match has been brought off last week between the birds of John H. Flanagan of Boston and Jeremiah Muller, a well-known citizen of Ashport. Both men have devoted much time and attention to an improved breed of bird, and the challenge is an old standing one. The pigeons were backed to a large amount, and there was considerable local interest in the result. The start was from the deck of the transatlantic steamship Spartan at ten o'clock on the evening of the day of starting, the vessel being then reckoned to be about a hundred miles from the land. The bird, which reached home first, was to be declared the winner. Considerable caution had, we believe, to be observed, as British captains have a prejudice against the bringing off of sporting events aboard their vessels. In spite of some little difficulty at the last moment, the trap was sprung almost exactly at ten o'clock. Muller's bird arrived in Ashport in an extreme state of exhaustion on the following afternoon, while Flanagan's has not been heard of. The backers of the latter have the satisfaction of knowing, however, that the whole affair has been characterized by extreme fairness. The pigeons were confined in a specially invented trap, which could only be opened by the spring. It was thus possible to feed them through an aperture in the top, but any tampering with their wings was quite out of the question. A few such matches would go far towards popularizing pigeon flying in America and form an agreeable variety to the morbid exhibitions of human endurance which have assumed such proportions during the last few years. That is the end of That Little Square Box by Arthur Conan Doyle. Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio, 2020.